Before I read this morning's scripture, I'd like to give you some background that will help us enter into God's word with fuller understanding. Our text this morning in the book of John is, in my opinion, the most unique of the empty tomb stories presented in the four gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The three disciples in this passage each respond differently to what they see or what they do not see. In the preceding chapter, 19, Jesus looks down from the cross to provide for his mother's care. After a drink of sour wine, he bows his head and takes his last breath. His relatively quick death by crucifixion standards spares him from broken legs, a custom used to hasten death. Instead, his side is pierced to ensure that he is gone. Both the broken bones and the piercing fulfill the Old Testament words of Zechariah, who looking forward to the Messianic age preaches, and I will pour out a spirit of compassion and supplication on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that when they look on the one whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly for him as one weeps over a firstborn. By the social standards of that day, Jesus should have received a criminal's burial, which meant being left on the cross. Or, at best, his body might have eventually made its way to a previously used tomb, later to be removed for the use by another criminal. Fortunately, Jesus was Jewish, and the law prevails, insisting that nobody be left unburied. Jesus, thanks to his secret disciples, receives quite an honorable burial. Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea provides a rock-hewn tomb in which no one has ever lain. And Nicodemus, the Pharisee who once questioned Jesus about being born again, Nicodemus arrives with a mixture of burial myrrh and aloes weighing 100 pounds, more than enough to properly bury the king of the Jews. Listen for the word of God as written in John 20, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and he believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you weeping for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have ta taken him, and I will come. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned around to him, and in Hebrew said, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. 
but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I was just a little girl, my family lived in a new housing development in Palo Alto, California. These new houses, called Eichlers, were situated in straight rows with young saplings planted between the very white concrete sidewalks and Ross Road. All the houses looked alike, flat roofs, pitch ceilings on the inside, sliding glass doors looking out onto small backyards. My best friend Carol Ann lived two doors down. Her mom was a tiny bit of a thing who didn't wear a stitch of makeup. Mrs. Baxter made clothes for herself and Carol Ann, dresses that hid, hit mid-calf and always made, it seemed to me, from some drab brown fabric. Carol Ann's family was conservative. My mom and hers would have tea, though I can't imagine what they found in common. Since my mom was a home ec teacher who loved color and design and was always fiddling with the food placement on our plates, wanting it to look beautiful before it was served. One thing Carol Ann had that I wanted was a live-in grandmother. She was a nice lady. I remember her by her frequently burned toast. She would stand at the kitchen sink and scrape off the black stuff before she buttered it. Well, one day, out of the blue, Carol Ann's grandmother died. I have vague memories of wanting to comfort Carol Ann. I'm sure that came from Sunday school and from watching my mom minister to her friends. When I was so young, I just didn't know what to do. I was young, and I was afraid, and I was only five years old. I was just a little blonde kid with a Dutch cut standing outside their house, looking into their garage full of bicycles. A garage that now seemed empty. Today I call this memory the Baxter's empty tomb story. I could not figure out what everyone was all broken up about because darn it all, God was going to make everything all right. In Sunday school, we'd learned about those miracle stories, how Jesus raised those dead people and made them just as good as new. Jesus always came through, or so I thought. Why, Carol Ann's grandmother was just going to be gone long enough for God to fix her up, then he'd send her back again. Just what was all the weeping about? This morning, I'd like us to take a deeper look at the three disciples in John's story as they encounter the empty tomb on Easter morning. In Matthew, Mark, and John, the synoptic accounts, angels speak telling the women who come to the garden that Jesus has risen. In John's story, the disciples come to the same conclusion by themselves according to what they see or do not see. Because this passage is long, longer than normal, may I suggest that you open your pew Bibles and follow along. Beginning with verse 1, on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb. Mary comes alone in the dark, in contrast to the other gospel accounts that tell of a group of women. Her heart is troubled, she cannot sleep, and so she comes to grieve alone. Perhaps she is edgy, having navigated the dark streets. It was a dangerous time of day for a woman to be out alone. Was she, like many of us, afraid of the dark? 